Welcome, everybody. Uh, it is uh, January 12th, Tuesday evening. Chat with two rabbis. Welcome, Rabbi Zvi Khan and Rabbi Barry Silver. We're so pleased to have you both. And with that, let you take it away, gentlemen. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sharon, for all you do and for keeping us all connected during this pandemic. If it wasn't for you, I don't know what we'd be doing, but we're really able to unite and come together and share so many different things because of your efforts. I appreciate it. Uh, Rabbi Khan, it's always good to see you and it's great to see everybody else who's on the uh, line with us. Uh, so we have an interesting passage this time about Va'era, which uh, deals with the uh, beginnings of the plagues. So uh, Rabbi Khan, you want to share some thoughts about Va'era? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so in this week's uh, Torah portion, uh, as Rabbi Silver just stated, we, we have the beginning of the story of the Exodus from Egypt, and it starts with uh, Moses uh, coming and telling Pharaoh, let my people go, and, and uh, of course he refuses, and the beginning of the plagues, uh, the ten plagues start, and this, this particular Torah portion of Vaera describes the first of the seven uh, plagues, the first seven of the ten uh, plagues, but I think before the plagues even start, it's really important to note that the Torah uh, emphasizes the fact that the exodus from Egypt, the ultimate leaving, when the people leave Egypt, that's not the end of the story. Many times people assume that it is, that that's kind of the climax and the culmination of the whole story because we're slaves. And then the whole point is we were freed. That is a huge, hugely important point. But the Torah makes it clear right in the beginning of this week's Torah portion that that's, the, that's kind of what Winston Churchill might have called the end of the beginning. There's this the beginning phase and the end of the beginning, the climax of the beginning of the story is the exodus from Egypt. Uh, however, then there are two more important steps, vital critical steps. One of them, of course, is leaving Egypt in order to get to Mount Sinai and to receive the Torah. And then the next step is to continue on the journey, journey to the land of Israel um, so really, you might say that the story of the exodus from Egypt is not just about freedom. It's about freedom from servitude, freedom from slavery, 100%. But it's also about accepting of responsibility. Freedom without responsibility, without accountability, is a dangerous thing. Uh, the idea of freedom, if it's taken to an extreme, freedom to do whatever we want, no matter who it hurts, no matter who it harms, is not a good thing and nothing to celebrate. So the idea is freedom in order to, 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 to go and take it to the next step and develop as a people with accepting responsibility, and then ultimately to be free in our own land, the land of Israel, which of course was the entire journey that the rest of the narrative that the Torah takes us on, and the Torah actually ends uh, without before the Jewish people enter the land of Israel. That story continues in the other books of the of the Tanakh, for example, the book of Joshua, of Yehoshua, who continues on after Moses. So I just think that's a, an important point to think about uh, because many times people think of whether it's the holiday of Passover or whether it's the story of the Exodus, they think it's all about freedom, period, end of story. And I don't think that really, that reading really works. And our Torah portion shows us that that's not really the end of the story. I agree with Rabbi Khan. Uh, Freedom is very important, but knowing what to do with it is also very important. And a lot of people become free and they're, they're free to destroy themselves or other people. In fact, it's interesting because when Moses reports to Pharaoh the words that God wants to convey through him to Pharaoh, it's not just let my people go. Most people just remember, let my people go. It's let my people go that they may serve me. So the whole point is that the reason why the Jewish people have to be free is not just so that they can enjoy the fruits of freedom, but because they have, an, we have a mission to do. We have, we have something very important to do to try to serve God. And so now that we have our freedom in this country or wherever, we have an obligation to use it wisely. And uh, the more you can serve other people, the more you enjoy your freedom and they do too. So I find that very important. The other thing I find very interesting about this passage, most people just figure, you know, when Moses is speaking, everybody's going to listen. You know, it's like E.F. Hutton. When he speaks, people listen, and he's going to speak, and everyone's going to just do ex exactly what he says. But 
didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> it's like he, he said to God, you know, well, they're not going to listen to me. So God says, well, you know, he's one says, tell me your name. So at least I have some credentials. So God doesn't really help him there. He just says, I am what I am. Sorry. So then Moses comes back to them and tells Pharaoh to let his people go. And what happens is it becomes worse. And Pharaoh gets upset and places more burdens on the people. They have to make their own bricks. And uh, so the people get mad at Moses. So most leaders, if they take a strong position one way or the other, they're going to receive a lot of flack. You know, not everybody's just going to say, oh, yeah, you're great. Whatever you're saying is good. So we should be we should expect that, too. If we speak the truth to people, we should expect that they're not just going to hear the truth and say, oh, yeah, I agree with you. It's going to be a lot of people who are living in delusion. You can tell them the truth. They're going to be mad at you. But specifically, what the Torah says is they did not listen to Moses because of Kotzeruach. Ruach, I think you know what that means. Ruach is spirit. Kotzer means shortness. So they were just so oppressed and so overwhelmed and so burnt out by slavery that they didn't even have the ability to hope anymore. And all they could think of is, let's just try to get by. And this is Moses just making things worse. They, they lost their ability to think that things could get better, which is a severe form of hopelessness. And uh, in our day also, sometimes we become hopeless and somebody is going to come along and tell us things that are really great. Like even with the, with the new administration, they might say, hey, we're going to have health care and we're going to do great things for the environment. And a lot of times people say, yeah, yeah, I don't believe that. And, they, and they, don't, they hear things that are really good, but they don't believe it and they don't get behind it. So I think what the Torah is trying to tell us is we should never lose our hope. We, we should always be willing to hear the truth or um, as the Torah would say, the voice of God, but I interpret that to mean we should hear truth and things that we need to hear and be willing to get behind it and to be inspired and to think that we can change and not become hopeless. So that's an important part of this uh, passage. Rabbi, you have anything you want to add on to that or you want to open it up? And uh, certainly want to talk about current events. There's so much going on, but go yeah. ahead, Rabbi. Uh, no, just one other a point, just one other reflection from the... Uh, from the story of the 10 plagues, um, you know, if, if we kind of reflect on the fact that uh, if, if, if God wished to, he could have gone, skipped all the early plagues and gone right to the 10th <laughs> plague, the, 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 the smiting of the firstborn. And then there, you know, the, the horrific nature of that plague is that the Torah says there was not a single house amongst the Egyptians where there wasn't a dead person. And every family uh, there was someone who died. And so that was the culmination of the plagues in which everyone was affected throughout all of the Egyptians, all of the families. It really kind of brought it home to them uh, and they were impacted. So, you know, many of the commentators ask, why, why 10 plagues? Why did, did it take so long? Why not do things that would have brought a uh, crushed the Egyptian spirit right away and they would have let the Jews go. Why so many chances? And, and one of the approaches to answering that question, I think is really important for all people to think about. And that is that um, God gives, God wants human beings uh, to be, to, to make the right choice. And uh, even if the human beings are doing a really bad thing, right? It was a terrible thing to enslave the Jewish people, to persecute them and, 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 to, uh, and, and to subject them to this terrible servitude for so many years, for two centuries. Uh, and so the Egyptians were involved in a pretty terrible endeavor, but nonetheless, God wanted to give them choices on their own to kind of prod them to make the right choice. So they had 10, 10 chances, 10 opportunities before, before God said, well, if you, if you haven't listened to all of this and you haven't learned your lesson from the first nine plagues, now there's going to be a plague that will certainly, you know, make it clear that you have no options here and you're out of, you're out of choices and there's only one option and that is to, to let the, to let the free the slaves and let the Jewish people go. And I think that the reflection for, for us in our own lives is that um, we should think about things that happen and think about the fact that as the rabbi just mentioned, it's never hopeless. There's always hope that there's a God has, has set up the world in such a way that we can always, I mean, we hope we always have the chance to learn from our mistakes. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, but we hope that we have the chance to learn from our mistakes and improve and never let things get so far and get so past where we should have already started changing and improving ourselves and doing the right thing that, that it becomes hopeless. We always want to 
you know, initiate actions to change things and get on the right path before things get spin completely out of control. So I think that's one of the ideas behind that resonates, at least for me, behind the 10 plagues and why, why there were those different steps leading up to the final plague. Yeah, well, uh, Rabbi Khan and I, as you, as you can see, we agree on a lot of things. And we also have a different approach in a lot of ways. Rabbi Khan tends to see God as very loving and kind and good and patient. And, and I see God, I, I kind of notice his rough edges. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that he's trying to give people a lot of chances, because actually what happens is he, it, the Torah says he hardens Pharaoh's heart. So it's really very cruel. I mean, the Egyptians suffer miserably. I mean, they lose all their cattle. They, they have blight. They, they have really horrific, horrific plagues that are afflicting them. Yet God isn't making it easier on them. And, and they're all accountable for what Pharaoh is doing. They live in a dictatorship. So it's not like they can all say, hey, let's take a vote. I vote to let them out. It's like they're dependent on Pharaoh. On the other hand, you could say the Egyptian society was sick because the society itself endorsed slavery and they weren't really complaining about it. So they kind of got their own desserts. But God hardens Pharaoh's heart. This seems kind of hard to square with a loving God. Why would he do that? Why would he intentionally make him have a hardened heart? And the Torah kind of implicates why. Because God wants to show off. He wants to show people, don't mess with me. You know, you mess with me. I'm going to just send plagues upon you. And, every, and he's saying, and in the Torah, saying, I'm doing this so everybody will know that I'm God and that I'm powerful and that I'm the God of the Jews and I'm their protector. It's kind of like he, he's putting on a show. And so he's kind of orchestrating the whole thing. He's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Then he's going to send the plagues. And then everybody's going to know what's going on. So the, the picture of God is kind of harsh. The, um, the traditionalists, I'm sure Rabbi Khan would tell you, oh, no, 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 you misunderstand. God didn't harden his heart at all. He was just a victim of his own bad habits. It's, it, the Torah says that, but really what was happening is Pharaoh's heart was already hardened because he was just a bad guy. And the society was really corrupt. And so it wasn't really God doing it. He just had a hardened heart because that was his own predisposition. But what we, can, what we can learn from this passage Sometimes people do things that are just really so harsh and so malicious, and it actually hurts them too. I mean, it gets them into a lot of trouble. And you can see that in this country. And we, we have a regime and, the, and some policies that are really harsh, and uh, they're not helping themselves or us. But you, you kind of ask, like, why would they do this? It must, it's almost as if they're being manipulated, because nobody in their right mind would act this way. And, and the Torah is trying to say, um, it, it seems like there must be some outside interference, but... There's just some people who are just hard-hearted and they've just got into a bad habit and they, it ends up hurting them. So when, when you're cruel, it really ends up hurting other people and you. And so I think the Torah is trying to tell us to re-examine our own behavior and, and see if, if it's almost like we're being manipulated. Or can, can we be a little better? Can we be a little nicer? And my dad always told me that this whole episode is really not so much what's going on in the Torah. It's talking about us. Within us, we have a little bit of Pharaoh and a little bit of Moses. Each one of us has a part where our heart is kind of cold and hardened and don't really care about other people. And each one of us has a heart that wants to side with the afflicted and help the oppressed. And we have to decide. There's always a conflict going on within us between Moses and Pharaoh. We have to decide who's going to win out in that conflict. You could also say that our society is going through that now. And um, the side of Moses is clearly the Martin Luther King side who we're going to be celebrating. He saw himself as a modern day Moses, liberating people, speaking about love, trying to bring people together. And, and then we have another side that's going on in our society right now is uh, people who are pretty rough and pretty hard hearted. And uh, our society is trying to grapple with which way we're going to go. Are, are we going to go with the, um, the more Moses type people or the, or the Ferrana? type people you now signs of uh, of pharaoh of dictatorship of tyranny of of oppression and um it's pretty grisly and so we we really have to decide which way we're going to go because if we don't go the right way it's going to hurt everybody including our own country so i'd um uh, uh, rabbi Kana, if you have anything you'd like to share on along those lines go right ahead otherwise let's open it up for people to talk about either the torah passage or the uh, current events yeah no i'd love to open it up Go ahead. Anybody okay. want to share some thoughts? Yeah. Anybody can open up their uh, microphone. I, I closed it while the guys were talking. So uh, just un unmute yourself and uh, go ahead.
Joel, I know you want to talk about what's going on in the world today, right? You were talking about it before. What's that? What's your impression on what's happening in uh, in DC? The the pictures out there on the on the wall. I mean, after what uh, he's the man said about his actions that they were, oh, everybody loved them. Everybody, I said everything perfect. I was the greatest. I'm dynamic. I'm terrific. I, 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 I. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of his I, I, I. I've had four years of I, I, I. What about we, we, we? <laughs> that is. You ought to take yeah. a we. Uh, anyways, um, it's, it's obvious to anybody with any intelligence or thinking smart that the man is very, very mentally deranged. He needs mental help. And we're, we're willing to do it. All he has to do is resign or Pence has to come along and be a mensch, which he's not. So we're going to impeach him. It isn't going to mean anything. It's just going to be another number. It's going to be a record. He'll be the only president that's been impeached twice. We don't need records. We need to get rid of the guy. I mean, ahead, I, my opinion. I see Misha nodding his head this way. Um, Misha, if they Misha. impeach him, doesn't he lose his pension, his travel allowance, and his ability to run again? First, first of all, he's not going to get impeached. There's going to be an effort to impeach him. The House and maybe a few Republicans will join. It will never pass the Senate. There isn't enough time. So that's that. But the thing is, he has probably, because of his own belief in himself and some of the things that he tweets about and so on, I don't think he could ever win the Republican nomination again. And he certainly isn't going to be a Democrat nor an independent. So for all purposes, he's done. And I kind of like what Biden said. Biden doesn't really want the impeachment process to go forward because eventually he may have to take a voice in that in some way. So as far as I'm concerned, he's not going to get impeached, but he's damaged himself sufficiently that I don't think he can ever run again. That's just my view. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, um, a few days ago, I was on a webinar uh, with one of the temples from New York. It was a very, very interesting. And it was an entire session with Ambassador Aharoni talking basically about the Abraham Accords in the Middle East, where all of these countries now are starting to co collate and join together because of a common, common enemy, if you will. And the conversation was extraordinarily interesting to say the least about the Abraham Accords. But of course, as conversations will go with 600 Jewish people watching a seminar, it went off in many different directions. But the one thing that I think stuck in my mind, which was uh, his, his take on the situation here in this country with our fundamental differences between the United States and Israel and the various points of conflicts, if there is, between the two countries. And he said what, what the Israelis are seeing and, and the, their perception is there is a fundamental difference that cannot be overcome. And he felt that that fundamental difference was is that Israel is proactive and America is reactive. Uh, so he was talking about the profiling and that they're, they're being maligned because they profile people. And he says, what we do is try to prevent a situation before it occurs. And because of your constitution or your laws or your perspectives, you are reactive. You need to see the weapons. You need to see the bombs. You need to see the development of, of, of weapons of mass destruction before you act, whereas Israel is proactive. They're seeing the, the, the profiling is coming down the pike. They will act on it before it gets to the point where they have to react. And he says he feels very strongly that that, that fundamental difference of proactiveness or reactiveness is something that is going to be a very, very hard step to overcome between these two countries, apart from all of the other issues 
and, and accommodations that we make to each other. It's an extraordinarily yeah. interesting conversation. Yeah. yeah, I happen to agree with that analysis. And you could look at climate change. Israel's a leader in fighting against climate change and developing technology and using their intelligence and when they develop that technology, they'll also become very wealthy because everybody's going to want their technology for becoming fossil fuel free. They're, and we're reactive. We're just like waiting for the next election. We don't really look to the future like 10, 20, 30 years in the future. But the other thing is that the reason why it's a little different today is because I don't think Israel's ever had a leader that was against the ideals and principles and values of the country. You know, we have now someone who is opposed to democracy and and places himself above America and his own personal interests. Israel has always had pretty enlightened leaders. Now, some of them, maybe they're not our cup of tea, but they've never had anyone who actually wanted to sabotage democracy and actually led a revolution and an insurrection. Yeah, but once again, you're focusing on a very, very narrow point. He was talking about general philosophies yes. of, of a country. He's not focusing on one specific individual or not. And I agree with him. And, and what he said also was a tremendous reaction, he said, from the general Israeli population when this situation occurred a few days ago in Washington. They actually, and he said that many Israelis were totally taken aback by it, was that they saw people going into our capital, literally wearing swastikas and, and, and anti-Semitic paraphernalia. And, and they were shouting those anti-Semitic terms. And he said the Israeli population did not realize that that movement was allowed to manifest itself to such a degree in this country to get to that point. He said that would have never, never happened in Israel because they would have been proactive in seeing this movement grow. It's and those are various that. points that he was making and the way he made it at such a level that it really made a lot of sense. And he says, the, a free country acts on a three-legged stool. One is protecting yourself. The next is protecting your people. And the third, he said, is, and it was this fascinating, he says, creativity. He says, Israel, by virtue of where it is and how it is and how it must survive, must be creative, it must be creative scientifically, it must be creative in diplomos, diplomacy, it must be creative in so many ways. So he says the third leg of that, that stool that we have to stand on, was, as he was saying, is creativity. And they are forging bonds with countries all over the world by being creative by having to help them with the water supply, having to help them with, with solar energy and re reusable energies. He says, that's the key. The key is Israel now is focusing on creativity. He says, and that's also a missing link he feels in a lot of aspects of this country. It was a fascinating webinar. Yes. Go ahead. Well, you know, I agree with you 100% that about the being creative and being proactive. So what is happening in this country that's gonna prevent more violence this weekend? It's really scary because these splinter groups, or I don't know what you wanna call them, really have plans to attack all 50 capital cities in the, in the country. Shouldn't we be doing something now to prevent that? Or are we just going to wait wait for it to happen? I think what we're overlooking, is, as I tried to mention before, it's not just a matter that we're not really paying attention. It's that these groups have always existed in the United States. We've always had domestic terrorists. What's different now is that we have a president who's actively encouraging and inciting them. That's, that's the difference. It's not like, oh, gee, we don't really know how to deal with them. He's actually manipulating them and encouraging them to be violent. So, for right, instance, but, for, in, but, for instance, he said to the Proud Boys to stand by and get ready. That's an anti-Semitic group. He said in Charlottesville that there's good people on both sides when some of them were actually pro-Nazi. He adopted a, 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 a policy called America First, which is pro-Nazi and fascist. It's, this isn't just some kind of accident like, gee, we're not doing anything to stop them. We have a government that's actually encouraging them. That's, what's the, that's the difference. Okay. 
But the thing that you're not understanding is that this didn't happen over the past two and a half years. This is a 30 or 40 year problem that we have had in this country with our overall leadership. I don't care what party you belong to. This has been allowed, this movement has been allowed to grow and it has not been stopped because we have not been proactive in stopping it as a so nation. So what are we going to do to stop this? That's I, what I, 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 I think. I think you're, you're missing the point. I'm not overlooking anything. I, I just finished saying there's been anti-Semitism in this country for decades. We know that. Yes. Yes. We've never had a president who actively encouraged and incited them. That's the difference. And what are we going to do about it? We're going to get an administration that's going to fight against anti-Semitism and not encourage it. There was a lot of anti-Semitism going on at that rally. Like you say, there were people wearing t-shirts saying that 6 million people weren't enough. There were people with uh, all, all types of right wing. This, this is, according to most scholars and historians who are examining it, this is white Christian supremacy. And it's the same type of philosophy that was behind the Civil War. This is the South rising again. And it's anti-Semitism and it's Christian supremacy. That's basically what's driving this movement. And, and we need to recognize, if we don't understand why it's happening, and we don't understand who's behind it, and we don't want to talk about it because of political correctness or whatever reason, then it's just going to keep going on and on and on and on. This has been fueled in the last four years until they felt licensed. They didn't even try to hide what they were doing. They were showing their pictures bragging about it because they thought the government was completely behind them and they were actually trying to take over the government. They were trying to start an insurrection and kill off people and it was, they, they thought they were going to overturn the government. And that's pretty much what Trump was encouraging them to do. This is a very unique situation. And if we don't recognize the danger, then we're going to be in trouble. Uh, Tina, turn off your... Um, yeah, uh, there you go. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's good to join the group. Um, Sveed's sister-in-law. So uh, hello from San Francisco. And... Uh, I, I did. Want, I didn't realize this would be so political because I'm like up to here with the politics, but <laughs> um, it's this like so much and so emotional. But there's a lot of Jews, including members of my family, who voted for Trump because he's good for Israel, and it just the the um, the dichotomy here is that he's horrible for the Jews here in America, and yet they're making a decision for an American leader based on he's good for Israel. So that kind of rationale has upset me. And, uh, but you know, you can't argue with some people. Uh, but I did want to say and comment on the dialogue that the two rabbis had, which was a punishing God and um, a loving God. And I think that that exists. And I, I think that a lot of people see what's going on in the world, not just now, but in life and things happen. And, and it feels like God is a punishing God. And you even read the Torah and you can see things that seem pretty outrageous and you go, whoa, not such a loving God. And I think that that has a lot to do with the diminishing size of people going to shoal. You know, it's, uh, people don't always, um, it, it, that's hard to take. And I don't know if that's any relation, but I, I know that uh, seeing, God isn't always seen as a loving God. And um, some of the stuff is tough. And when you see what's happening, you go, God, wouldn't God, you know, we need God to step in and, there's how many hundreds of thousands of people have died and um, just from one disease. And it's just really, it's tough. It's tough. So I'm really grateful to be part of this. And this is great dialogue. Thanks, Tina. Well, your, your observations is what motivates our congregation to take a different view of God. So at our, at our congregation, we take a rational view of God, which rules out a literal interpretation, because you're right. As you say, many people are turned off and they're not interested in Judaism anymore because they don't buy it. They, don't, they can't conceive of a God who's going to order genocide and harden Pharaoh's heart and 
execute people because they're violating the Sabbath. That, that concept makes no sense. So we have, we have abandoned it. We've allowed God to mature as, uh, as human beings have matured and we allow Judaism to mature. And so we, we don't espouse that literal view of God anymore because you're right, it makes no sense. And it actually, I actually believe that the concept of God, which throughout Jewish history brought people to remain Jewish in a scientific age is causing people to leave Judaism. And uh, it ha we have to evolve, as Darwin said, we have to evolve, otherwise the religion will become passe and it will be irrelevant to people. So we, we do take a very different view of God. And if you want, you can look at our literature and see how we uh, approach it. Anybody else? Suzanne, go ahead. I've got a new brand of Judaism, comic Judaism. <laughs> We're going to be focusing on that. We're going to find more excitement. And everything is going to be wonderful. We are looking at things in a positive light. If we all want to be environmentalists, we need to sell our cars, buy bicycles. And every time we want to go to the store or anywhere, we'll just get on those. I like that idea. A walk. <laughs> or walk. That's right. Until then, we're not environmentalists. <laughs> we're not Henry David Thoreau and Walden's Pond. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the implication, but if all of us do not become radicalized for the environment, then we're not going to survive as a, as a species as we do now. It, it, our, our quality of life and our planet is in, we're on life support. And I wouldn't really joke around about efforts to try to protect the earth because it's deadly, deadly serious. Absolutely. I do agree. I did. I, I have coined two different versions of, of com, cosmic and comic Judaism. And I, and I think both of them are very necessary because a lot of religious people take themselves too seriously. So it's good to have a light touch. Um, anybody else want to share some views? I saw, I saw hey, some similarity in what um, both uh, Rabbi Barry and Rabbi Svi, um, in their interpretation of the of the Torah passage, Vayera, I I actually my head was saying, "Gee, some of that happened last week, where people thought freedom meant storming the Capitol." You know, I mean. They felt like their freedom was at uh, risk and that they needed to stop the Electoral College from proceeding. So they had a different interpretation of what freedom meant. Um, we, I, I hope that we don't have that same philosophy, but um, I know I don't, um, but um, it, it's a shame. And I think what um, Emily said before and what Valerie and Mishka were saying, um, there were so many signs, so many tweets and social media and all this telling everybody what was going to happen the middle of last week. Right. There was preparations that people knew of. Um, my son said that he knows somebody in the government and the Maryland Police Department actually asked to come to be at the Capitol on that day, and it was denied. Actually, and the police the, the police department sent a, a correspondence to the Washington D.C. police, telling them that they knew that that, that for a right. fact that there were mobs that were going to descend upon Washington. So there was a lot, a lot of warning, and I think right. that's what hit home when I was listening to to uh, Ambassador Aharoni when he said, "Proactive or reactive, there is a big difference, and sometimes you have to be proactive." Well, they, I think they actually turned a blind eye, quote unquote. Yeah. They knew it was going to be. They chose not to be proactive. They chose to say, no, I don't want police there. No, I don't want any extra guards so that they could do their damage almost. Um, and then what is, and, and Emily asked this before. What is going to be in the 50 capitals? Because they're going to have the National Guard. 
And they're, the National Guard right now are in charge of the distribution and logistics of getting us the vaccine for COVID-19. So now they're going to come off of the COVID-19 agenda and move towards securing the capitals of the 50 states. So we all lose. <laughs> you know? That's right. So, you know, so, you know, hopefully that's going to happen. And hopefully uh, arm, other armed guards are going to come out in full force and protect oh, our yeah. state capitals as well as our national capital. Sure. Um, yes, it, it's really, it's horrendously scary um, yes. what's going to be before before the 20th or on the 20th even, what's going to happen. You know, let's be real about what's going on. OK, it's not proactive or reactive. It's President Trump is proactive towards creating or attempting to create a fascist state. He withdrew support from the police, from the Pentagon, from the defense, from the government agencies because he wanted the takeover to occur. He egged it on. He encouraged it. And while it was happening, and they were crying out for help. He was just looking on and cheering. It's not a matter of they were negligent. He intentionally wanted to facilitate their takeover of the government by emasculating the defense that we have. And the reason why I say that is kind of obvious. First of all, he's already said in the past that he, as the president, has absolute power and that according to the Constitution, he can do anything he wants. No president has ever said that. And any president who ever does say it, we should already know this guy's dangerous. He already he also said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it, which means that he believes that he could do anything he wants, even lead to the death of five people in the Capitol, and he could get away with it. He also referred to himself as the second coming of God and the king of the Jews. This is sick. This is psychotic. And when someone talks in those terms, you better expect that they're going to do something that is completely crazy. So this is not something that, gee, how did this happen? At his own rallies, he told people to beat people up, carry them off in a stretcher, and he'll pay their legal, be their legal fees. This is something that we were not proactive. We didn't see the war. Well, some people saw the warning signs, but too many people didn't. And as far as the Jewish community is concerned, this is a deep, deep stain on the Jewish community and on the society of Israel that would support someone like this because they think he's good for the Jews, which he's not. And to, and to make a deal with the devil by siding with Christian fundamentalist extremists in order to try to do what they think is gonna help Israel. This is something that we need to, we need to do some soul searching Assuming that some of these folks have a soul that you can find. This is a serious business and it's not over. Um, uh, Barry, uh, an old friend, a political activist that you might remember, a black guy named Rodney Stratham. I don't know if you remember Rodney. Okay. Yeah. Just put a thing from Paula on Facebook that was written by not Trump, but one of these crazy people. And it says, in the next 24 hours, I would say, let's get our personal affairs in order. Prepare our weapons and go get them. We now have the green light. All who resist us are enemies of the people. And this is what, Trump or no Trump, this is what's going on in our country. So what do we do? That's my question. The, the only thing you can do is not just say kumbaya, Let's all let bygones be bygones. We have to understand there's a serious threat and the threat has to be understood, recognized and confronted. And that's why they're pushing through with the impeachment, even if it won't work, even if it's not gonna get a conviction as Mishka says, it's because when somebody does something that outrageous and that illegal, you have to take a stand because you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. And you have to at least as a society say, this is wrong. And, and combat it. And what we're combating now is domestic terrorism. Right. And it has a religious component and it involves right-wing Jews and right-wing Christians working in cahoots. And we need to evaluate our own religion and see where did we go wrong? Are, are we perpetrating a type of God 
who inspires people to just accept him on blind faith and not use reason? Is, is our concept of God causing us to give up our use of reason anymore so that anybody can come along, any demagogue can come along and, and uh, mislead us? Go ahead, Joel. This is a another situation of these people don't like the blacks. They want to take back the country because they believe the blacks own the country. If it was black people out there, there would have been a, a massacre yeah. and it would have been against the blacks. Now, the blacks aren't going to sit back because if you know anything about our military, our military had a high percentage for years of black soldiers. They couldn't get people to serve the black. So went in, it was a good place for them to uh, to make money, to, to live, to, to build something. Those people are out there. The blacks have their own militias. They're not stupid. We don't want it to come to what it could come to, but it could be that situation that these people think that they're in Bowdoin because of the president the white supremacists, and they are. But the FBI was on today. They've already put in o over 100 indictments. They know most of the people, because these idiots were on there streaming and showing their pictures and all that. They've got the software and the hardware to get out there and find out who these people are. And they're getting them, they're collecting them fast. They know who the leaders are for the most part. They're looking for the guy with the pipe bombs. There was two pipe bombs placed, one by the uh, Democratic office and one by the Republican office. They want that person, and they think they know who it is, and they're getting close. They're not sitting on their hands. They're being proactive, as, as are other agencies, and they will draw upon those agencies. We just got to get in the, to office. We got a few days to go. We got to make it to those few days and hopefully it, it, it'll work out. But this is where we're at. I, I, I just took my, uh, whatever I'm getting my son's, my son who was in the 101st airborne and Ricky says to me, dad, I got to get a gun. I says, what are you talking about? He says, because of those crazy people. I says, you're not getting a gun. You're not going to have a gun. He says, you know, but but this is the, this is the mindset of the person who's not who's white, who's not them. He is ready to go against them. Meshugana. But it's you're right, Barry. This is this is a situation. It's not only the white supremacist Christian supremacists that they're against us and the white people. They're against the black people and the and the Latin people, the people of color. That's who they want because they want their country back. They never lost their country, but in their mind, they lost their country. Yeah, you, you raise a really good point. And, and the black people have fought back in the correct way. They went out and voted and they acted responsibly and they followed the teachings of John Lewis and Martin Luther King. But we saw in the 60s that if that doesn't work and they become dissatisfied, then they might go the Farrakhan route. So far, I agree with you, Joel. If they have to, they'll fight back with violence, but so far they haven't. But if, if this doesn't turn out well, they will fight back with, with violence. And, and those white to... supremacists will lose. They'll lose. They, they'll they will lose. lose. But also Biden, Biden taking over as president isn't the end of the story. There's still a whole bunch of people out there who are very, very dangerous folks. But I want to introduce a ray of hope that I think Emily will uh, agree with me on. And that was the, um, the manager, or the, the coach, of the Patriots. Bill okay, Jack. Now, yeah. Yeah, right. now, I, don't, I don't know much about football at all, but I did, I did hear about this guy. This guy is amazing. Th this guy, not only has he won all these Super Bowls, he gave up a medal of freedom and he showed his true medal. And he showed that before he didn't want to medal in politics. He just went along with what Trump was doing. And now he decided to medal. And this guy, what he, what he said was something very interesting. He said that his team started to become aware that they have an obligation as people in the public eye to help the world and to do something good with the publicity they have and to work for social justice. And he said it was so exciting, it was so thrilling to be a part of that. And he said that was far more important to him being part of this movement than any medal could have been. 
And I, I think this, this gives us hope. There's a lot of really brave, incredible people out there that are fighting back and that, that gives us hope. But, but I, do, I do insist though, that if we just have a naive approach and just think everything's gonna be fine and it's all gonna go away and we should just let bygones be bygones. If someone committed a murder, you wouldn't say, hey, let's just let bygones be bygones. You know, let's just all make peace. You, you have to have justice and you have to, you have to punish people. What, what happened is extremely serious. <laughs> There's an attempted coup and an attack on democracy. You can't just let them try again. Because you're right, Joel, this is very, very dangerous. And if it's not punished, these folks aren't going away. <laughs> They're going to be encouraged and we need to, we need to fight back. Perry, if they don't have two or 300 buses parked very nearby the Capitol, put these people, arrest them for even looking the wrong way and take them in. I, we're a country of laws, but you know, sometimes you got to bend the law a little bit. Well, that's called being this is proactive. Not, yeah, I think you right. got to bend. This is important to bend. Thank you, Joel, for, for reinforcing what I just yeah. said. Well, and what Ambassador Har Haroni said, you've well, got to be proactive. I know you got to be proactive, but you, you, we have to watch because the laws are there for to protect everybody, supposedly. You don't you want to bend them. You don't want to break them. That's right. You don't want them broken. You want to bend them enough that that you can work it out. Mm. But if you break them, it's hard to put them back together again when you do need them. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a fine line Harris. between no. what's treason and what's not treason or what's sedition. Like that that passage that I just read that was uh, from Parler that somebody had reposted yeah. on Facebook. Treason. Yes. Thank you. To me, that's treason. It's treasonous. Absolutely. There's a lot of that garbage around. There used to be it on Facebook. They'd stopped it now, finally. Right. The garbage that was, I used to go on a wet, on the, on the, uh, on Facebook in those sites. Yeah. And it, 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 Martin Vercel had a site and the, the craziest people came on his site. He was talking legitimate talk. And these people came in and, and many of them were Jewish and they gave him, what are you talking about? The Democrats stole it. They fixed it. They had the. They're believing this nonsense. They stupid. The Democrats aren't that smart. I mean, come on. I mean, it doesn't. It's not something that you can put together in one day. This was. This was to believe that kind of nonsense coming from Jews. Yeah, Supposedly, I looked them up. A, a professor. One was a professor. One guy wrote four books, and you should read read what they wrote. Yes, they're treason. It's treasonous, what they said. And it was all over the web. It was all over the web, everywhere you looked. Yeah. Harris, Rabbi, you wanted Rabbi. to say, Harris wanted to say something. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I have nothing to say, but uh, I just want to mention that uh, Israel has been bombing Syria, especially the Iranians and Hezbollah. And in an Arab newspaper, it said they're waiting for uh, Trump to get out and when Biden comes in, they expect uh, the Iranians to uh, fight back against uh, Israel. So it's interesting. We'll have to see what happens. Oof. This yeah. was also another comment that uh, that Ambassador Haroni stated that Syria, unlike Lebanon, they say they have no problems with Lebanon and Lebanon and many of these other countries, but Hezbollah in Syria has aligned itself with Iran. That, and he made a specific point in saying that. He said, that's where we have to focus. And that's where we have to be extraordinarily proactive. And he specifically mentioned the Hezbollah in Syria aligning itself with Iran. He says the other Arab countries, he says he, he sees down the road that they will have accords. He does see that in many of these other countries because that seems to be the common enemy. And he specifically mentioned that, that situation in Syria. Yeah. Rabbi Khan, what's your take on all this? I think we live in extraordinarily dangerous times. It's a, it, it's it's uh, truly heartbreaking to think our country, you know, the United States of America has reached this point uh, where we're dealing with these kinds of issues that nobody would have, you know, thought possible. But but the signs were there, and 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 now we have to hope that it doesn't get worse. Uh, you know, uh, Rabbi Silver, you hit the nail on the head when you said this is an extremely serious situation. It's a dangerous situation. Uh, but we do have a new administration coming in, 
and uh, hopefully it will protect itself and its leaders and the American people better than what we saw with the Capitol uh, siege. You know, we need much better, we need much better defensive measures and preparation than what we saw. But I think the country's capable of it. We've surmounted the United States. You know, if you look at the history of the country, we've surmounted uh, even more serious threats and dangers. And, and, but this is up there. This is on the list of the serious threats and dangers. We just have to, uh, you know, we have to, we have to pull together and, and protect ourselves and start moving things in a totally opposite direction than the way they've been moving. Yeah. Um, I'm worried because I remember that after the Civil War, Lincoln was shot and there's a lot of people who are very dangerous with weapons who want to take out Biden and Harris and uh, I'm very nervous for them. I agree with you, Rabbi Khan. I think we're going to get by, but we need to be uh, proactive in, uh, in rooting out these folks and, uh, and really taking strong action to, to, to protect our uh, democracy. Maybe Rabbi uh, Silva, we could add another word to your cosmic. We could say proactive cosmic jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always say shorter is better. So <laughs> that, that could be a tagline. <laughs> we'll make that a tagline. Go ahead, Aris. Yeah, so we had a discussion whether uh, Lincoln was Jewish. And yeah. now, I can, now I can prove it. Well, his first name was Abe, and he was shot in the temple. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. I think that's a good note to end on. That's it a, is. <laughs> especially to promote comic Judaism. That's a good way to end it. Thank you very much, Harris. Thank you all. Tomorrow Thank night, we have at 7 p.m. Friendly Fire with Rabbi Barry Silver and Mike Essen at 7 p.m. on Zoom. The link is on our website and uh, is also in our voice newsletter that came out this morning. So um, if you want more controversial discussion that will be it discussion from the right and from the far left <laughs> so um thank you all for attending tonight have a great week let's all be safe and vigilant <laughs> tina and thanks for joining us nice seeing you thank nice you, seeing everybody, everybody else thank, thank you, you rabbi khan thank you rabbi thank khan. you rabbi barry